Dependency managers don't manage your dependencies. It's May 5th, 2021, and I promised to write and speak about tech, so let's start building our JavaScript infrastructure muscles. In the next several posts, uh, podcasts, and videos, I'll cover introductory topics on dependency management, the story of Jest, because that's something people have been asking me to talk about more, actionable tips for making your infrastructure better, and predictions for the future of JavaScript tooling. We'll slowly develop our shared understanding so that we can talk more deeply about JavaScript infrastructure. So there's this post to depend about dependency managers. The next post will be rethinking JavaScript infrastructure. There will be one uh, post about building a JavaScript test framework and bundler, uh, one post about um, the Jest story, and then a final post, or maybe even uh, multiple um, that I'll be announcing soon. So we are dependent on dependency managers. JavaScript dependency managers such as NPM, Yarn, or PNPM have had a tremendous impact on the JavaScript ecosystem's evolution. They enable the constant search for novel solutions in the front-end space. However, their ease of use and the high modularization of packages come with many downsides. Existing JavaScript dependency managers are actually not very good at managing dependencies, um, even though they're called dependency managers. Instead, they're primarily convenient tools to download and extract artifacts, with a few task runner capabilities sprinkled in. This article won't solve the fundamental problems of package managers. The next article um, and the next video will be much more controversial, I promise you. But instead, I'm hoping to provide the definite guide um, to avoid black holes on your hard drive, um, in case you have seen the meme about how big node modules can, be, uh, can get. And it will um, allow you to gain control over your third-party dependencies. Many tools will analyze, parse, process, or do something with files in a node modules folder. Adding many large dependencies tends to slow down install time significantly. So in my experience, install times grow at an above linear rate as the complexity of the dependency, dependency graph increases. Fewer packages will lead to few, uh, faster install times, even if the packages are bigger. Large dependencies also make all operations slower for everyone globally, even if individuals only use a subset of a tool, um, a subset of tools in a project. Applying the below methods reduces the size of third-party dependencies within uh, various different code bases. Um, for example, um, I applied some of these methods at um, Facebook's React Native code base, which is a large monorepo um, fully internal to Facebook. Um, I reduced the size of dependencies by an order of magnitude and then also improved install times of dependencies by an equal factor, and I was able to sustain the wins. So taking ownership of dependencies. What, what would it look like if we actually took ownership of our dependencies? As discussed in a previous post about principles of developer experience, an example is reducing external dependencies or choosing them more carefully. Yes, third-party dependencies undoubtedly help us move fast initially, but using them means we lose control over our stack. We gain option value and control by removing dependencies or by actively maintaining them. So concretely, it looks like this. First, analyzing dependencies. Second, removing unused dependencies. Third, keeping dependencies up to date. Fourth, cleaning up duplicated dependencies. Um, five, aligning on a single package for a well-defined purpose. Six, forking packages when necessary. And seven, tracking the number and size of dependencies. This guide primarily focuses on yarn one, but many of the recommendations will equally apply to other package managers. One thing to keep in mind is that some package managers will use symlinks, hard links, or other tricky and opaque ways to avoid installing dependencies directly. I have tried some of them and was involved in the creation of another, and I've also seen the death by a thousand cuts at scale with those solutions. Let's take it for granted that materialized files on the file system are the only way to go. Just like first party code is you know, stored on the file system and in version control. All right, let's dive in. So analyzing dependencies. First, we need to get an understanding of what kind of packages are in our node modules folders. We'll analyze our dependencies using various methods, and I haven't found a good all-in-one solution um, to analyze the node modules folder, so instead there are four different tools that I use. One, and I'll put the links into the show notes, disk inventory X, and like some command line stuff to analyze the size of dependencies in node modules. There's a command called yarn Y, including the package name, which uh, you can use to explain why a specific package ended up in your dependency tree. It lists all the other packages that depend on it and uh, on that package and which version the, they depend on. 
there's a website called Package Phobia. You can use it to see roughly how big a package is on disk. And there's another um, website called Bundle Phobia, which you can use to check how big a package usually is when it's bundled into an app. Second, removing unused dependencies. It may seem obvious, but many projects carry a lot of dead weight. It's much easier to add dependencies than it is to remove them. You may have multiple dependencies that you're keeping around and maybe even keep upgrading, even though you aren't using them. I recommend auditing all existing dependencies listed in a package.json file to see which ones uh, can be removed. This analysis is usually a manual process, as static analysis tools may miss some dynamic use cases. I recommend using ripgrep or using the search functionality in your editor. And you know, let's say you'd like to check if you have finished migrating from moment.js to date functions, um, so you can you know remove the moment library. You can run something on the command line to check for require or import statements, and then see if um, it shows any results. If it doesn't result, um, if you don't have any results for a package, usually I check for the exact string because you know, looking for dependencies using um, um, just a simple search, you might miss something in like a configuration file, um, like in Babel, ESLint, or Jest that take module names directly. If you remove one of those dependencies, you'll likely break something in your project. But once you confirm that the package is not in use, you can remove it from package.json, run yarn, and then, you know, repeat this process for each package in your dependencies and dev dependencies. There's a tool called depcheck, that, you, that can do this in a more automated fashion, fashion by npx step check, but the same caveats apply. Third, keep your dependencies up to date. Have you ever experienced upgrade cliffs? That's when the version of a dependency is so far behind that upgrading takes significant effort and slows down entire engineering teams. I've found that making upgrading part of everyone's ongoing responsibility amortizes this cost over time and across engineering organizations. With this approach, people will move slightly slower on average, but they'll never face getting stuck because it's too hard to overcome uh, a breaking change. Keeping all the dependencies up to date will make it easier to move away from legacy packages and follow through with uh, this guide's subsequent steps. You can use Yarn Outdated and Yarn Upgrade Interactive to check for and upgrade your dependencies to their latest versions. There's also a dependabot on GitHub, but from my experience, people spend less time validating those changes than if they do it manually. However, be mindful of breaking changes and bugs. The more automated testing you have to increase your confidence, the closer you can stay, um, to, uh, stay up to date with the latest version of your dependencies. There's nothing worse than upgrading a package for the sake of being on the latest versions without understanding the changes and causing an issue in production. For example, I used to track Babel's releases closely at Facebook and build a system to compare the previous version's output to the new one for React Native's product code. It allowed me to ship updates with confidence, and in some cases I managed to deploy a new version of Babel to a billion users within like eight hours of its release. Cleaning up duplicated packages. The algorithms used in some of the JavaScript package managers aren't continuously optimizing the dependency graph. You likely have to have a log file that's responsible for installing, multi, uh, installing multiple versions of the same package, even though only a single version would equally satisfy the expected semantic versioning range. There's a tool called yarn deduplicate that can be used to optimize your log file in those situations. And I generally recommend use, uh, running it every time a package is added, updated or removed. Um, and there can also be a verification step on the continuous integration pipeline that fails if there are packages that are duplicated. The tools that cause the most trouble with this problem are monorepo tool chains such as Babel or Jest. I worked on projects where we had four versions of Babel's parser, two versions of almost all of Babel's plugins, and three versions of various Jest pa uh, packages. Yarn deduplicate worked to some extent, but there was no good way to update all those packages to use the latest versions. I tried everything, from manually updating all entries in a package.json to require the latest versions, to using Yarn Upgrade and Yarn Upgrade Interactive, to using Yarn Resolutions to override semantic versioning constraints and log all packages to their latest version, but none of these worked well and often made things worse. I found that the only way, uh, only reliable way to ensure only one version of each Babel package is installed on a project. On every Babel upgrade, manually remove all the entries related to Babel in the Yarn log file, and that gives Yarn a chance to start over for a subset of its dependency graph you'll end up with a, sim a single version of each Babel package, the latest one. 
And unless, of course, you have dependencies that require a specific version, in which case it makes sense to upgrade those dependencies first or also use yarn resolutions. Another suggestion is to explore the similar ranges of packages that you depend on and send pull requests to upgrade their dependencies or change pinned versions to accept similar ranges so that downstream proje projects can uh, benefit from more deduplication. There's a lot of similar repetition in this text. Um, align on a single package for a well-defined purpose. On a large project, you may end up with multiple packages serving the same purpose. And sometimes you may end up with multiple major versions of the same package. I've found that on larger teams, somebody may pull in a large dependency and use it exactly one time, bloating the production bundles, all while a similar and smaller package was already widely used in the code base. You can avoid this problem by using strict style guides, documentation, and code review. Still, even in the best environments, this is further exacerbated by similar transitive dependencies included by a direct dependencies. For example, two of your direct dependencies may include the same package to parse command line options that's different from the one your project is using. It may make sense to analyze which packages are in your node modules folder and align on a single package for each purpose. Fork packages when necessary. In some cases, packages are unmaintained or they are too bloated or moving too slowly. It doesn't make sense to block a product feature at your company because you're waiting on a third-party open source maintainer to make a release to a package that you're using. I noticed that people are hesitant to forking packages. I recommend being more liberal with the fork button on GitHub and publishing your own custom versions of packages. Forks don't have to be long-lived. They can serve as a single purpose, like pulling forward a fix for something that can be removed later. Um, and yes, that can add a maintenance burden, but it also places you in control of more of the code that you're running in your projects. For very small changes, you may prefer to use the pack, uh, patch package uh, instead. There's a system use, uh, using Yarn resolutions where you, that you can use to swap, uh, swap out existing packages with a custom fork in your package JSON. Um, you basically just put in a resolutions key into your package JSON and then you list the packages that you want to remap to something else. I previously did this with a popular package that ships uh, 20 megabytes of stuff when only about 2 megabytes were necessary. We used to have 3 copies of this package and aligning on a single version and then moving to the fork reduced the space it occupied by, uh, from 60 megabytes to about 2. Usually after forking a package I will send a pull request to the original package. For example, um, I improved a package called Remark Prism that um, reduced the size of disk from 10 megabytes to about 0.03. Um, most of the time I intend to keep um, a fork short-lived, but sometimes changes can be at odds with the package owners, and I'll keep the forked version and that's fine too. Track the number and size of dependencies. It's great to reduce the number and size of dependencies once, but it's better to sustain the wind long term. I recommend setting up a continuous integration step that analyzes the size of node modules using something like um, a bash script um, within a project whenever a yarn log file or a package JSON file changes. If you make the CI step run on every pull request and if the size increases compared to master, you can alert somebody to take a look. While you can undoubtedly build automation to prevent people from checking in new modules, I found that the best results can be achieved by talking to people and building a shared sense of responsibility across everyone working with the same code base. After all, it's tough to know whether there's a good reason to add a dependency or not, and you don't want to end up uh, being a gatekeeper. Instead, it's helpful to point out that adding large dependencies will make things slower for everyone or, point, uh, you, know, or you can point people to similar packages that they're using already. Most of the time, it turns out that people just didn't know better and they'll appreciate the help. For example, I recently ran into a case where somebody added a few packages that would have doubled the size of our node modules folder. Simply pointing it out, explaining why it isn't ideal, and giving them two or three other ways to solve the problem helped avoid shipping the pull request um, in that state. Think about it this way. If somebody adds 100 lines of code, we put that code through a lot of scrut scrutiny in pull requests uh, during code reviews. If somebody adds a single line to a package JSON file that pulls in 100 megabytes of code into a project, bloats the production bundle, and slows down tooling, we usually just wink the change through because we don't see the implications of the pull request itself. You could um, avoid this problem by checking third-party dependencies directly into version control. 
There's a few other recommendations. For example, Yarn has an auto clean command that can automatically remove files matching an exclusion list, and you can use it to remove anything that's not relevant to your projects, such as examples, tests, markdown files, and others. You can enable it by running Yarn auto clean um, and checking the resulting Yarn clean file into version control. Unfortunately, this command runs after installing dependencies instead of during an initial install, meaning that every invocation of Yarn will be slower, sometimes even by multiple seconds. It's an excellent feature, but I only recommend it for projects that check node modules into version control. To which degree the above suggestions will work for you will depend on your project and the team. At least you'll gain more control uh, over your project and reduce the uncontrolled growth of third-party dependencies. At best, you'll prevent workflows from regressing in performance and always stay lean and fast. Next up will be rethinking JavaScript infrastructure. Um, thank you so much for um, um, listening to this again. Please tweet about this article or share it with your friends. Maybe discuss it with the community or email me if you have feedback. Um, thank you so much for listening and have a great day.